Wall Street crash. In 1929, the world was reeling into the most terrible economic depression in recorded history. In July 1931, about 8 million workless tramped the streets of the United States alone. Nearly 3 million people in Britain were unemployed. It was calculated that, throughout the globe, more than 20 million people had been thrown out of their jobs by the creeping paralysis that had brought the world's trade and industry grinding to a halt. The great boom of the 1920s had collapsed into hunger and despair. The first storm signal of the hurricane to follow was the crash of New York's stock exchange, the momentous debacle of October 1929. If any single day could be said to have launched the depression on the world, it was October 24, 1929, Wall Street's Black Thursday, when sheer panic swept the foundations from the most powerful financial center in the world. A few faint rumblings of the coming storm were audible before 1929. America ignored them with buoyant optimism. Was not the United States, unscathed by World War I, the richest and the most powerful nation on earth? Was not industry booming as never before? Were not millions of Americans enjoying a standard of living never dreamt of in old-fashioned and quarrelsome Europe? Statistics confirmed the rosy picture. By 1927, no fewer than 283 Americans were paying tax on incomes of more than a million dollars a year, compared with 75 only three years earlier. By 1929, there were more than 23 million automobiles on the roads. Factory workers drove to their jobs in second-hand Buicks and Fords. Sales of radios rocketed from $400 million in 1925 to nearly $850 million four years later. American prosperity, said the experts, had reached a permanently high plateau. Beneath the ballyhoo and bathtub gin of the 1920s, they declared, lay the solid rock of American industrial might. Republican presidents, first cautious Cal Coolidge, then Herbert Hoover, sat in the White House. Sound businessmen ruled the country. The sage words of banker and stockbroker commanded the ear of the multitude. The truth was that the whole impressive edifice of prosperity rested on a treacherous quicksand of credit. Millions of Americans had mortgaged their future to keep up with the Joneses. Industry was wildly ever expanding and forcing its mountains of goods on the public only by high-pressure salesmanship and credit payment schemes. The American way of life had become a gigantic gamble on the future. Center of the gamble, where it boiled in its craziest and most dangerous form, was the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street. Through the 1920s, stock prices had been rising. Not until 1928 did the big bull market really get underway. Vanguard of the boom was radio, automobile and aviation shares. In ten days in March, Radio Corporation of America leapt from 94 to $155. On March 27th, a total of 4,800,000 shares was dealt in, three times a normal day's trading only a year earlier. What was happening was that hundreds of thousands of Americans, ordinary citizens who had previously hardly known preferred stock from a potato, were plunging on Wall Street for the first time in their lives. As the great boom roared on, tales of fortunes made overnight swept the country, from Fifth Avenue millionaire to East Side barber. Americans poured feverishly over lists of stock prices. Subway and trolley bus echoed to discussions on mergers, margins and bond issues. A million Mrs. Joneses reminded Mr. Jones that Mr. Paperhanger across the street had bought a new Willie's Overland car with his profits from a gamble in Union Carbide, while Mr. Schmidt had brought a lot of Miami with his winnings from Anaconda Copper. Why didn't Mr. Jones do the same? Mr. Jones was only too eager. Every economist and financial expert was ready to assure him he could never go wrong in investing in America's future. The gateway to Easy Street was wide open. The trouble was that Mr. Jones, with his limited savings, could not compete in the market with the millionaire gamblers who bought and sold shares in blocks of 10,000 at a time. There, however, the helpful stockbroker was waiting and anxious to assist him. Mr. Jones, explained the broker, could operate on a mysterious system known as margin trading. He need put up only a fraction of the cost of the shares. The broker would borrow the rest from a bank and lodge the shares with the bank as security for the loan. When the shares rose, as of course they would, Mr. Jones could unload, 
the bank could be repaid, and the fortunate Mr. Jones would pocket the profit. It was as simple as that. By the end of 1927, stockbrokers had borrowed $3,500,000,000 from the banks to finance margin dealings by their clients. The banks charged interest of up to 8%. It was a profitable business for them, as long as share prices kept going up and up. In June 1928, Wall Street suddenly cracked. It was only a temporary stagger. A few thousand timid gamblers were shaken out. Prices then skyrocketed on with new and increasing vigour. Some conservative economists began to fret over ominous signs in the latest industrial graphs. Car output, housing and radio sales were slowing in a saturated market. Farm prices were sagging. Over in Europe, credit had been shaken by the collapse of Austria's biggest bank and the Hattree scandals in Britain. Nevertheless, the Wall Street carnival went on, with stock prices spiralling to fantastic heights. By September 1929, brokers' loans had leapt to $6 billion, a great mass of gambling credit that inflated stock prices, kept turnover boiling at 5 million shares a day, and represented the hopes and dreams of investors from one end of America to the other. Between March 1928 and September 1929, General Electric shares soared from $129 to $396, Westinghouse from $92 to $290, U.S. Steel from $138 to $279, and Radio Corporation of America from $94 to $505. By the latter month, it was calculated that more than a million people had stocks bought on margin. Speakeasy waiters, typists, farmers, small tradesmen, even street cleaners were playing the market, queuing up outside the broker's windows to gaze fascinated at the latest news from the street. In September 1929, the great upward surge suddenly lurched to a halt. Prices cracked sharply, recovered again, slipped back, and wavered uneasily under a storm of selling. Wall Street, said the financial soothsayers, was facing a temporary period of readjustment. The economic system was as sound as ever. From the White House, President Hoover issued a comforting statement that he did not consider brokers' loans too high. The tidings of good cheer, however, were all in vain. The skids were under the bull market at last. Once the avalanche of selling from frightened and overborrowed gamblers started, no power in America could stop it. On Wednesday, October 23rd, more than six million shares were flung on the market. The average of 50 leading stocks dropped by 18 points. The ticker tapes, chattering into the offices of startled brokers, ran nearly two hours behind the trading on the stock exchange floor. It was obvious what the result would be. Late into the night, the brokers' clerks toiled to send notices to their clients, calling for increased margins to cover the day's losses. The stage was set for the debacle. Few Americans, however, realised next morning that the end had come. Trading on Black Thursday, October 24, 1929, began quietly. Before noon, prices were falling, faster and faster, then crashing headlong into an apparently bottomless pit. The torrent of selling started with the countless small gamblers who could not meet their margins. Each plunge in prices brought a fresh wave of forced selling, till even the biggest speculators were throwing blocks of 10,000 or 20,000 shares into the crashing market. While panic roared through Wall Street, representatives of New York's most powerful banks met secretly in the offices of J.P. Morgan and Company across the road to confer with the Morgan chief, Thomas W. Lamont. Between them, they agreed to form a fund of $250 million to bolster the tumbling market. Richard Whitney, vice president of the exchange and broker for the Morgan interests, hurried to the floor to bid for 10,000 U.S. steel shares. The bankers might as well have tried to stem Niagara Falls. Nearly 13 million shares changed hands that day. Prices hurtled even lower as selling orders from frightened and ruined investors flooded in. Until dawn next day, lights burned in the broker's offices as weary clerks, surrounded by piles of telegrams and ticker tape, posted off urgent demands for more and yet more margins. 
In every town and city, white-faced men flicked over their newspaper pages with trembling fingers to read the fatal stock quotations that meant ruin. Wild rumours ran through the country. A dozen bankrupt brokers were reported to have suicided. Troops were allegedly guarding Wall Street against an angry mob. President Hoover was declared to have ordered the closing of the exchange. For a few days the panic seemed to ebb. Then on October 29th, with 16 million shares thrown on the market, stock prices went into another sickening nosedive, dragging yet more broking houses and their clients down to ruin. Worse was to come. In the dark days of 1931-32, to 32, the great king blow to world prosperity was the cataclysm of October 1929. Black Thursday started a wave of fear, destroyed the basis of credit and optimism on which American prosperity was founded. Buying dried up, industry slowed, the ranks of jobless and destitute swelled. The apple salesman lining Broadway, the night-long queues outside the East Side refuges, mark the end of an age for America. Wall Street had provided a spectacular finale for the fabulous 20s.